Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to another lecture in the virtual lecture series by faculty. I am Azmat Hussain, and I will be the moderator for this evening's uh, talk. Today's speaker is Dr. Uh, Sultan Nazar Mohammad Azizo. Sultan Nazar is a senior lecturer in mathematics based at UCS Horo campus. He received a specialist diploma at radio physics and holds a PhD degree from Emmanuel Kant Baltic Federal University, IKBFU. During his scientific career, he worked with world renowned leading experts on nuclear magnetic resonance and nuclear quadruple resonance, NQR, fields at IKBFU. Institute of Nuclear Physical Methods of Research, St. Petersburg, Gebze Technical University, GTU in Turkey, and Kazan State Power Engineering University. His research uh, mainly is related to tetrazole derivatives investigation by the means of NQR. The title for today's talk is Resonance and MW Detection of Improvised explosive and illicit materials. And uh, I would like to give floor to uh, Dr. Sultan. Dr. Sultan, uh, you Thank you. Thank you very much, Asmat, for this introduction. Felt good. <laughs> anyway, MW states is for microwave detection of improvised explosive. And this job was done at Gebze Technic University. It's on the Istanbul Kojaili province. And today I will have uh, an assistant from my colleague from Gebze Technical University. He will uh, be, he'll uh, join us a little bit later maybe. Anyway, uh, it's one of the um, greatest uh, technical university in Turkey. And I'm proud that I work there for more than one year. And I was invited by people that take their masks off. Uh, what you can see from left to right is uh, Dr. Georgi Mazjuhin in the center, uh, Dr. Bolat Ramev, and the third person here, the, uh, one of the enthousi enthusiasts in uh, quantum computing in Turkey is uh, Morteza Vafadar, and he will uh, join us and he will uh, show the uh, device uh, that we were working on. During my work at Gebze Technical University, I was uh, working on three projects. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the NATO project. And uh, NATO has this um, good um, grant, uh, NATO Science for Peace and Security. And uh, this, uh, the group that I mentioned, they uh, have had uh, two uh, NATO SPS projects. And each project is for three years. And it's a huge one. So one they had on NQR, and I participated in that a little bit. And the next uh, one they had in this, uh, the title, in microwave and NMR. And one year I was working in the framework of this project. So uh, what is the, why do we, if they even need this and why NATO approved uh, this project? Because uh, it has, they, uh, it is related to this uh, aviation and public security. We all of us know that, uh, especially in airports, uh, you are not allowed to bring your um, you know, liquids if they are over than 100 millimeters. And um, that is, of course, for the security reasons. And uh, uh, the European Union wanted to get uh, uh, rid of that rule by 2020, but uh, still, and there is no um, device that could very fast uh, scan and identify is the liquid at least safe or not, and could we take it with us or not. And this is because of a lot of um, problems uh, that uh, people face when they try to make this kind of device. And I will very briefly talk about some of them. And uh, so the goal was to develop the effective and fast technique of identification of explosive and illicit substances by the use of two techniques, nuclear magnetic resonance, reluxometry technique, and microwave dielectric spectroscopy. Of course, both of these, uh, the first one is especially well known in uh, scientific community as, and uh, it is widely used in medicine and chemistry and even in physics. 
um, because this is a very powerful tool which allows us to uh, work and I, um, to investigate some uh, unknown substances. We can uh, learn what is uh, the, um, not just what is the structure of that molecule, or even if we can say uh, many things about its molecular dynamics. And uh, nuclear magnetic resonance is um, um, the idea of it uh, that uh, spins that have uh, the nucleus that, that have non-zero spin, they, um, they have uh, angular moment and thus they have um, magnetic moment. And uh, so if we apply external magnetic field, all those nucleus will try uh, to, in, in the simple case, in uh, proton case, they uh, will try to um, uh, align and along that uh, magnetic external magnetic field, and they will have only two energy levels. Because in if there's no external magnetic field, our energy levels are degenerate, and uh, and uh, when we apply it, we know maybe you heard about Zeeman effect and this kind of effects. These energy levels they are split, and uh, how uh, far energy levels from one each other it depends. On the uh, on the magnetic field, and if we uh, then add another perturbation, if we uh, act on these uh, nucleus that are in this state, yes, um, uh, with uh, radio frequency pulse at Larmor frequency, it is the frequency at which these uh, uh, nucleus they have this precession, and if we apply it, then we may, and if the our frequency is right. Uh, then we may uh, see this mediate, we may mediate this transition from the lower to the high state. And uh, um, so that is, and then, then we'll have this resonance and we can uh, then collect the data, collect the uh, response from the system and analyze it, see the uh, frequency shifts and so on and so forth. So um, the thing here, um, it's a very powerful tool, but uh, the high resolution spectrometers are very big and they are expensive and they uh, have high maintenance cost. And to work with this, you need a specialist. You cannot, uh, I mean, you need to learn all that stuff for a while. And uh, that is not something you can put in the airport or anywhere. Uh, thus, uh, this is a big problem. Uh, and also uh, some of the experiments when we're talking about uh, learning these molecular dynamics and uh, investigating some difficult uh, molecules, they could, could uh, it could be very time consuming. But what we are looking for, what uh, the governments and these security guys are looking for, for a device that will give uh, an immediate response, at least uh, in I don't know, 30 minutes, something like that. They are very strict about the timing. And of course, this kind of uh, solution wouldn't be um, good enough. Um, what we have, we have a high resolution NMR. Uh, and on, of course, we also have a low field NMR. It's low resolution NMR. In this case, uh, the magnetic field uh, of few Teslas, while on the previous slide, it could be tens of uh, Teslas, 20 Teslas. For example, but here in low field, we uh, write uh, on the left uh, these, these uh, about just a little bit 1.4 Tesla or something like that, and on the right it's about one. Uh, it's a little bit less than one Tesla. Uh, these uh, um, uh, magnets we they use in GAPS, It's in the laboratory. The uh, the second one was specially designed, calculated, and then fabricated at the university and just special for these uh, project. And I won't be able to show all the details and some um, parts uh, of these device, but uh, this is the magnet, one of the magnets uh, that, that uh, they are using and they are going to use in the next prototype. So um, the low field and the problem here cannot see the, the big piece as we can see in the previous one, just with one scale. Here we can uh, work with some uh, nucleus. What we do, we usually do so-called time domain 
NMR, we you, we learn some uh, we, we learn the relax, uh, the relaxation uh, times T1 and T2. Very special. This is the time uh, which we need. So which system uh, which this system requires to get to the normal state to relax. Yes. And uh, okay, this is not that important. And the other part, so I was mostly working with the nuclear magnetic part since that's my, uh, that's what I used to do. But also uh, this, the second part, it's microwave detection. In this case, uh, you can see there's a bottle, there's a planar material and uh, that, and then what they do here, they uh, um, all, all, all the time they uh, see, uh, they check uh, the shifts in in uh, signal. If there is some, uh, if if you if we, this bottle, if you change the position of that bottle, uh, the distance between uh, the planar material and the bottle, then we can observe some shifts in uh, uh, in signal, and we can see also how it uh, the peak itself its Q factor changes and spells. And also there was done by um, Ukrainian partners, there was done a big job here and they, um, uh, and they, uh, they, they sh revealed that one of the um, obstacles that we have, you see in case of the microwave detection, the, um, these characteristic lines, uh, which is, uh, uh, you can see here it's resonance frequency, Excess and the one uh, um, the uh, one divided by q uh, axis and in the, this case uh, these lines are very sensitive to the thickness of these material so that's one of the huge problems and uh, uh, there is to there is no easy way to overcome this problem and again what kind of restrictions we can have here on the first step, of, uh, we should take it in mind, and we worked with the uh, uniform bottles, uh, less than uh, 0.5 millimeters. And the other one, of course, uh, we uh, learned that it will be very difficult to work with glass bottles, and we are not even talking about uh, aluminum bottles or any other <coughs> non-plastic bottles. So this is the first major obstacle but since um, uh, we did uh, some progress here, and right on the graph, on the picture, you can see uh, the prototype. It's the uh, first prototype that uh, we have built there last year. And uh, now I would like to invite my uh, colleague and friend, Morteza Mafadar. Morteza, are you here? with us yes yes i'm here okay i would like again Morteza. Uh, he uh, is a phd uh, student at gabza technical university he works at that laboratory and he uh, assisted me with many projects there and uh, his main area of interest is uh, quantum uh, computing and quantum computers and stuff and also he's very good in lab group development so, uh, Mortaza, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Okay, uh, in this slide you see the actual, I will show the actual device itself here in live action, and uh, we will make some measurements. And uh, then I will uh, talk about a little about the LabVIEW program, how, uh, what is the, uh, what is the uh, purpose of this program, how, how is the environment of the program and then detection techniques that we use for detecting these liquids. I will talk a little about if we have time. So if you go to the next slide, yes. Okay. Here it is. Here, here, yeah. This is the inside of the um, uh, uh, device that we uh, put together to uh, assemble all of the uh, this, um, uh, detecting uh, compartment. Uh, we have here uh, two, uh, uh, one analyzer, one generator, which together they work as a vector network analyzer. So since your background is not that much in uh, physics, I won't go to details. 
We have our new card. Uh, if you can show Sultan Nazar the Arduino card. Yes. Yeah, no. that's that's one. Uh, that's the Arduino card which we control by PC, and uh, we have a, a generator and analyzer. Can you show them? Yes. Generator. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, there is a switch which uh, switch between uh, yeah uh, the uh, between um, sensors. We have uh, three of them here. Uh, but it is designed for four of the sensors or resonators. Uh, here we just have a three of them. So it's uh, sequentially uh, switches between the sensors uh, and uh, repeats uh, within cycles. So it's uh, constantly uh, just change the sensors and uh, make a measurement and uh, goes to another sensor and make measurement and uh, again. And uh, this cycles uh, happens all the time. While it uh, makes this uh, measurement and takes the results, we have a stop motor. If you can show the step motor, yeah, that's the step motor, which moves the stage of the uh, liquid, which we put our liquid on that stage. But I will show here, it is not shown here. Uh, there will be a stage there, and uh, we will put our liquid there, and um, it will go close to one sensor or far from another sensor. and. Um, it starts from top and goes to the bottom, uh, so it uh, simultaneously make uh, gets far from the up sensor and goes toward the uh, two bottom sensors. So this uh, happens me uh, when the system all the time takes the measurement. So if we go to the schematic uh, slide, yeah, yeah, here this is the schematic. Uh, view of the device. We have a PC which is connected to analyzer and generator. We have a microcontroller, which here it's Arduino card. And uh, we have a RF switches, which switches between uh, sensors, which uh, is shown in middle. And we have a sample bottle, uh, the yellow one, and the step motor uh, it is, it, it, uh, stays on the step motor stage. And the step motor just uh, moves it uh, towards sensors or far from the sensors. And all of these um, uh, uh, parts are inside the assembly box, if you look closely. OK, uh, now I guess I should uh, show in live action. I just want to connect to uh, Zoom with my uh, phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me then stop sharing. Yes, yeah. Uh -huh. I should, um, okay, I should enter the password, sorry. Just a second. Yeah, there's a security stop. <laughs> yeah, they add. No one else can join us. Okay. Now I'm, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, we can see you. We can see you. Okay. Okay. Yes. That's good. Now I will also share my screen. We so, see screen. So you can see simultaneously uh, the program interface and the device. Uh, and yes. Sorry, I, yeah, I need to maximize this. Okay, here we go. And uh, now I will run the program. Sorry, not running. This is a lab view interface. We have a main VI, which is front panel of the program. And uh, it's a graphical coding program. It's very useful in laboratory environment, very uh, handy, very uh, nice tool for uh, research purposes. And uh, I just started the scan, which shouldn't I, because I should put some liquid there. Okay. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Here we have our samples, our weekly sample. This one is methanol, which is illicit, which shouldn't be allowed in the airport cabin. So we will try the first try with this one. I started this scan and it uh, moves the liquid towards sensors. It uh, goes uh, far from the other sensor. Okay, it says that it's straight. So, so far so good. And then it turns back to its initial uh, position, ready for another measurement. Here we have water, let's try water, which is uh, safe and we should, should be allowed to, um, to uh, uh, carry with yourself. Now I start. Okay, it moves uh, towards uh, others, two sensors here, and there's one sensor here. So you can see it says it's safe. And while it's um, scans, while, while it's moving the liquid, uh, it, it, it scans uh, the quality factors and resonance that you can see. So uh, there is a characteristic curves for three of them. And uh, from those uh, characteristic uh, curves, it can detect what liquid it is. Now I'm gonna show the detection. Uh, I end this uh, on the connection. Uh, I'll show the detection. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah, uh, algorithm, how we detect. So uh, for detection, uh, we use very simple method. It is called the uh, polygon. Um, uh, Polygon uh, area or polygon method, uh, which just um, uh, we draw a polygon uh, 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 around the curves that we wanna to be detected or be called as safe. Here, this uh, polygon uh, I call the detect region is around the uh, water and 40% ethanol because. 40% ethanol also can be considered as uh, safe because liquor, uh, <laughs> alcoholic drink can be considered as a safe. Uh, someone maybe want to take it instead of some alcoholic feeling, which maximize to 40% of alcohol uh, mm, uh, 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 what is constitution, uh, uh, ingredients. Mm -hmm. And um, this uh, polygon um, just uh, wraps around the curves that which are safe. And if it is uh, outside this curve, it uh, says that um, uh, how much, how many percent. Yeah. And also it, uh, if you have a, a point, uh, some of the points are curved inside like this one here, uh, inside the uh, polygon, it will say, okay, uh, how, this percentage of the curve is inside the polygon, so it is, uh, how many percent it is safe or how many uh, percent it is not safe. So this is uh, the way that we show the percentages here. Here we have a infection percentages, 100% in, in this case is safe. This is for the safe, 72% for, for another uh, uh, sensor, which is here, IRE2. Here, yeah, uh, it has a little different shape for the curves. And if the curves in the uh, places inside this polygon, uh, it says that it's safe. So uh, in our case, it is 72% of it is inside this uh, polygon. But uh, this is the way that it detects. And this is for the last, the third metal, uh, metal uh, sensor. And uh, here again, uh, we have the same uh, uh, story about how we detect them. Mm. Uh, safe from threat. And now I gonna show, now you see the how um, the um, LabVIEW program uh, works, how it's handy to make such a uh, fast and very reliable environment for measuring and uh, uh, detecting uh, uh, various signals. I'm gonna talk a little about the environment itself. 
So LabVIEW programming uh, is a graphical programming language, which mean, it means that you just draw your code. You have a while loop. Uh, this is my uh, own code. So it is a little complicated for this stuff. It has a uh, different in the states and it uses the state machine architecture or uh, design pattern uh, to, uh, for, the, for the coding. So uh, before, uh, uh, I wanna a little show you how uh, this state machine uh, design pattern uh, works in LabVIEW. Here we have, I have a very simple uh, example of the code. We have a um, main uh, state machine loop, while loop. Uh, in LabVIEW, uh, we can draw our loops. I can show here structures, for loop, while loop, case structures, uh, similar to the other languages, but here we just draw it and we put our code inside that. Here we have a while loop, which is like this one, and it, it stops uh, if some condition happens, some conditions, uh, 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 some condition uh, become uh, 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 what they say um, uh, viable, and then it's um, then uh, so it has uh, one uh, data cluster uh, which um, is the our inform initial information that passes between the different states and. Uh, uh, it, it starts from some initial states. In this case, it is initialized. And uh, so our initial information and our initial states goes into the while loop. And in that loop, it's uh, process for uh, uh, while the program is running. And from initial, uh, initialized, uh, we can see it goes to next stage is the wait for the event. So next, what is the next uh, um, state? Here, it just waits for an event for the user to put input some uh, comment and then it will uh, change its, its state. This is also uh, useful to see. Uh, our program starts here and goes to initialize states and then immediately goes to wait for event. And from here, it uh, waits for the user to input uh, some uh, comments and uh, depending on the type of comments, it does uh, some uh, goes to uh, specific uh, states and then come back to wait for the event and uh, waits for another um, uh, input. And when he uh, the user to press stop, it goes to the stop state and terminates the program. Uh, even I can show the program uh, itself while running. We here I can run the I can uh, uh, highlight the uh, process uh, itself, the um, flow of information, let's say. And if I run it, you can see these dots shows that uh, uh, the value of this uh, uh, information uh, uh, threads. And now, uh, it first it go then to start and then after uh, initialization it uh, changes its state to wait for uh, event and here now we are at the uh, wait for event states so if I press something here it is written like something when I print uh, something it uh, captures record uh, captures this uh, command and uh, goes to the user state one which is uh, through this this pop up. Uh, window and I press OK, then it goes to another, uh, uh, wait for another. This is how a state machine works. Um, it's very uh, expandable and easy to understand for non uh, computer scientists, you know, uh, researchers, because uh, not everyone can be a, a programmer. So this is very useful, and other researchers can understand the code and expand it at our own states or. Mm, modify the state and reuse them. So it is very widely used pattern. I guess you can uh, appreciate uh, how this program works. And um, yeah, and then I press exit 
of course, the uh, exit states and uh, performs exit, which terminates the while loop and the programs terminates. Now the program is uh, stopped. Um, so, uh, yes, yes, thank uh, you very much, Martin. Yeah, yeah. And uh, thank you very much for this. And, and now let us. Um, let me share. Can you please stop sharing your screen? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I can reshare my. Okay. Thank you very much. It was very useful. Also, me and Mortozao had uh, to use some to make some Arduino development in order to work with the. Uh, uh, to, because uh, to work with that microcontroller of Arduino and to make to switch between different sensors, collect the data, move that um, platform, and so on and so forth. So, uh, on, in this um, uh, this prototype that is now on the table that was uh, allowed us uh, to show to you, it is the microwave part and. As I told, uh, said earlier, uh, what should I mention here? These three sensors, what's the difference between them? Uh, first of all, the main difference is the frequency. Because the, um, the uh, dielectric primitivity of the liquids, it's, uh, it depends on the frequency. And in usual, again, the long way, you need to uh, make, um, to have some kind of spectra of that. But uh, it is a very time consuming, which, and we cannot, uh, and we need only fast, fast approaches. So in this case, we decided, and it was shown uh, in our published, in our publications that it is quite, uh, we can rely on at least three uh, frequencies that we uh, uh, select three frequencies and, um, and see how uh, the uh, parameters uh, changes uh, with the distance. And let me greet now, the main uh, leader of the group that I show, it is Dr. Bolat Ramev. Hello, Dr. Bolat Ramev. How are you? Hello to everybody. Thank you. And <laughs> to Sultan Azar for the excellent presentation of our activity. Uh, I was very glad to hear his presentation. Uh, sorry. But I will leave for you the main uh, thing, the obstacles part and the obstacles that we face you, especially for the two more years with this project. And what do you plan to uh, do further with this um, pro prototype? How are we going to develop it? Uh, I would like to say that we visited Ankara together with Murtaza, we visited uh, uh, how can I say, uh, I am trying to translate from Turkish, uh, Department for uh, Civil Air Transport, and uh, we have met the following uh, things that we need, in order to go further, we need to obtain certification for our device. So currently I'm concentrated on the, our problems and uh, maybe, in a few months, I will return to these things because I realized that in order to go further, we need to make some bureaucratic procedures. So, uh, I am trying, uh, currently I am not pushing in this direction because I see some bureaucratic uh, obstacles. And on, our, uh, on, on the other side, I would like to say that we have submitted the new proposal and I prefer to wait um, uh, before, uh, up to the state when we, we will have enough money to go further. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, now, everyone, if you have questions, you have a great opportunity to ask, especially Dr. Blot Ramit here. Uh, so, he's the of our by project. the way, I, I would like to uh, say good luck to you in your uh, new place. Uh, I, uh, I hope that you can continue cooperation with us every time. Uh, we will be glad to accommodate you, to uh, 
uh, in order to have some um, joint studies, maybe to continue cooperation in this direction or our direction. It will depend on you and uh, our state. So uh, again, good luck. Uh, sorry, I have to leave this meeting. So okay. uh, thank okay. you for this presentation. And uh, I hope that your uh, presentation was interesting for everybody. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Bartomir. See you soon. Hope to see you soon. See you. Bye.